I want to welcome everyone this afternoon to joining us uh, November 2nd, 2022. This is our fourth and final webinar of the Boston Epigenetics Society. And if you're not familiar with us, I just want to say that the mission of the Boston Epigenetics Society is to promote epigenetics and epitranscriptomics research and to foster connections between academia and industry and, and foster that connection to try and promote epigenetics research. And actually, we're doing it across the globe. Um, I, want, I want to send a huge thank you to the, the entire leadership team. And our leadership team is, is represented from, from groups across the, the Boston area. And I'd like to give a big shout out, especially to our sponsors. Um, Cantata Bio helps with a lot of the heavy lifting. So organizing the webinar, handling the registration, um, all the nuts and bolts of putting this together um, is handled by them. And, and we really appreciate that. Um, I also want to give a shout out to 10X Genomics for, for their help as well as Active Motif, who helps us promote it. And Active Motif is actually on right now. I'd just like to say hi to our, our friends uh, out on the, the left coast. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, we have a group of about 25 folks here. We're really excited for this talk. Um, you only get to see me at the podium right now because our camera is mounted on the ceiling. But um, trust me, there are about 25 folks here. Say hi. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> So that's great. They're, they're, they've organized a watch party um, out in the West, and John McShane is representing 10X Genomics, and he says hi. And also, if you want to get in touch with us, the best way to get in touch with us is through the LinkedIn page. And we're always looking for speakers and, and people who are want, in, interested and willing to, to help out. And our LinkedIn page is here. And then after the presentation, uh, the talk will be posted on the Cantato Bio uh, website as well as on the LinkedIn page. And as I had mentioned before, this is our, uh, our final event for 2022. We've been very fortunate to have um, just fantastic speakers and, and um, a lot of the success comes from that, but we've attracted over a thousand views for each of our webinars um, so far. So I think that really speaks to the enthusiasm for epigenetics research and, and the growing interest in the field. Um, I also wanted to um, point out a couple of future events. So we're having our first uh, our first in-person gathering is going to happen one week from today at the Mighty Squirrel Brewing Company Brewery and Tap Room. And you can see our LinkedIn page for details, or you can go to Eventbrite and Google um, uh, Boston Epigenetics Meetup, and that will also uh, come to you. And our next webinar is being planned for February 2023. Uh, the speaker is to be determined, but stay tuned. And, and finally, I just want to give a plug. Um, one of our organizers is looking for postdoc positions right now in epigenetics research. So if you're interested in doing a postdoc in uh, epigenetics, please uh, reach out to Ye. You can see her email uh, here at the bottom. As well, this will be posted on the LinkedIn site. And um, before we get to our speaker, I'm going to hand it over to Sierra, who's going to introduce um, a little bit about what Cantata does, and then she will turn it over to Jen Castro, who will be our MC for today. Thank you very much, and thanks for tuning in. Thanks, Brian. I just wanted to echo what Brian had said, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, without you, obviously, this is not possible, so thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Sierra McWilson. As he stated, I'm the Sales and Account Development Manager with Cantata Bio. I realized I did not give you guys my contact information previously, so here this is if you would be interested in reaching out to me. At Cantata Bio, we are building multiomic approaches to solve tomorrow's problems today. I actually focus in the epigenetic subportion of our company, uh, and with that, we are trying to provide a non-biased view of spatial genomics. We can do this to include 
more of your genome in the analysis and more um, per, per base read support, efficient use of sequencing data for increased sensitivity and non-motif based results. So you are getting biologically relevant information. Cantata Bio has four spatial genomic pieces. Um, we have our TopoLink is our newest assay. We also have MicroC, HiChip, and our pan promoter enrichment. I did want to introduce you quickly to TopoLink today. Uh, so our TopoLink is actually the, the newest uh, piece that we offer. It is a six-hour protocol from start to finish, not just the proximity ligation portion, but actually six hours to get you to sequence-ready data. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and pass this over to Jen so she can introduce our speaker. Thanks, Sierra. I'm really pleased today to introduce Dr. Um, Alan Huang. He is the Chief Scientific Officer of Tango Therapeutics. He joined Tango five years ago after serving a leading role in the creation and launch of Tango at Third Rock Ventures. Under his leadership, Tango has developed a cutting edge functional genomics platform to discover novel synthetic lethal interactions and advanced a strong pipeline of precision oncology targets into various development and clinical stages. Alan brought to Tango with him over 15 years of experience in oncology research and most recently from Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research. As the, head, as the global head of oncology translational research, Alan was responsible for generating trial enabling preclinical concepts. And under his leadership, the group advanced many key compounds through development and registration. In his earlier roles, Alan was responsible for a variety of drug discovery and target ID platforms in oncology, most notably pioneering the pooled um, shRNA-based screening technology. Prior to joining Novartis, Alan worked at Millennium Pharmaceuticals as a senior scientist focusing on the discovery of novel targets to treat metabolic diseases. Today, we're very happy to have him as our keynote speaker. And he will talk about the discovery of MTA cooperative PRMT5 inhibitors for the treatment of NTAP deleted cancer. Thank you. And on to you, um, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Jean, for the introduction. And uh, I also want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me here. Um, I'm actually not a epigenetics uh, person uh, or scientist at all. So, um, you know, we happen to have our uh, lead program uh, as an epigenetics target. So, uh, I'm for today's talk, uh, it's mostly going to be focused on a drug discovery story rather than, uh, you know, a deep dive into the epigenetics mechanism. So, don't expect to see any chip sick uh, experiment. Uh, but uh, I would love to use this opportunity to really. Um, you know, hear feedback from uh, this uh, special group of expertise. Okay, this is my disclaimer. Um, before I get into PMT5, I'd like to maybe make a uh, quick introduction about Tango. Tango is a precision oncology company. Um, in my opinion, precision oncology is all about therapeutic window. Um, whether the mode is looking for oncogenic driver or other lineage factors drivers. Uh, the idea is to make sure that the target you find has a differential effect in your targeted cancer cell versus other normal tissues without that particular uh, genetic or pathway abnormalities. And uh, our effort was more focused on uh, using synthetic lethality as a platform to looking for that therapeutic window. And uh, we have uh, last few years developed a um, platform that is mostly based on the CRISPR technology, but use that to looking for uh, additional novel synthetic lethal interaction and advance some of the target into drug discovery. And uh, uh, the, the work, including the traditional um, cancer cell based uh, syntax diesel, but we also expanded the concept to including the immune based immune evasion uh, as a, a, a very similar um, concept. Um, and uh, this part of the work actually is the basis for 
uh, our collaboration uh, with uh, Gilead Science. Um, and um, some of the program now is in drug discovery, different drug discovery phase. Uh, the two program we highlighted here uh, that uh, uh, the most leading one, one is a PMT5 inhibitor, which I'm going to talk about today. The second one is actually a also an epigenetics target, uh, targeting the co-rest complex uh, deacetylase activity. Uh, this we actually identified through the genetic finding discovery that uh, this is particularly uh, uh, useful in treating STK11 mutant non-small cell lung cancer. And uh, we believe a, a major mechanism of STK11 effect is through the immunization of those cancer cells. Um, so here is a glance of our pipeline. Uh, we have two PMT5 program uh, now in a different stage. The first one is in already TNG, now it is already in the clinic. The second one for 62 is about one year behind. Uh, and we believe this could be, you know, the first class of, you know, first in class PMT5 inhibitor uh, that is MTA cooperative and uh, 462 could be the best in class. So for PMT5 and uh, MTAP uh, deletion, I think the, the context here, um, MTAP is actually itself is not a tumor suppressor gene. The reason it's often deleted in cancer is because of the, it's a chromosome neighbor of a important tumor suppressor gene, CDKN2A. And uh, because of the close proximity uh, in 80% of the CDKN3 deleted cases, MTAP is going to be uh, co-deleted. If you service through TCGA, uh, as you've shown here, roughly you know, 10 to 15% of all cancer cells, uh, human cancers are MTAP now. And some of the indications uh, with more prevalent CDKN2A deletion, such as this uh, uh, malignant neurosheath disease, uh, GBM, they have a uh, quite significant uh, number of uh, percentage of population with MTAP now. So overall, a very large population and uh, a significant uh, mathematical need. The synthetic interaction between PMT5 and MTAP was discovered uh, you know, a few years ago by several different groups, including Novartis and Broad. Um, here is the data that Novartis published on the left side where they used uh, a SHRNA platform and uh, you know, surveyed about 400 cancer cell lines. Uh, in this case, if you look at the lethality score of uh, SHRNA against PMT5 in this panel and color-coded the cell line by the MTAP status, you will see a very strong correlation of PMT5 dependency only in the MTAP deleted cancer cells. And uh, the the mechanism is showing on the right side. The PMT5 itself actually is a, you know, essential enzyme. It is a methyl transferase uh, that uh, utilizes SAM as a methyl donor and methylate uh, uh, a large group of substrate. Uh, and the, the substrate, that, you know, the methylation they made is a symmetric dimethylation on the arginine group, so uh, also called SDMA. And, um, you know, in a way, we're lucky to be able to find it through the genetic screen because uh, if you use the CRISPR method, you will see that PMT5 is actually pan -diesel. Um And uh, but in the case of that screen background, what happened is that um, when MTAB is deleted uh, in those cancer cells, uh, MTAB actually catalyzes uh, you know the the uh, conversion of MTA, which is a um, SAM analog. Normally, MTA level in the cancer cell is very low uh, because MTAP really metabolizes it very quickly. But in the MTAP null cell, MTA will accumulate and those MTAs will compete with SAM, binding to the same binding pocket and really acting as intrinsic inhibitors. So in those cells, the baseline level PMT5 is already reduced. And on top of that, if you using SHRE and genetically knock down another percentage of proportional PMT5 activity, you will push it 
below a critical lethal threshold and the cell will die. And this is why this can't be only be discovered by shRNA uh, because it has a partial uh, inhibition or partial knockout, knockdown. Um, and compared to uh, CRISPR technology, which you will, you will probably completely ablate the gene and uh, you won't be able to see that differentiation. So with that data, I think at uh, that time, uh, initially the, the reaction is, uh, though there, there has been already many PMT5 inhibitors being developed, uh, some of them are near clinical stage and uh, can we take advantage of this? discovery. And to many people's surprise, uh, those existing inhibitors, obviously they were developed for completely different rationale, uh, rather as a general uh, epigenetics modulator than for this particular syntactic cell interaction. Those inhibitors, they do not really recapitulate the genetic finding here. Um, shown here as two examples. One is, uh, uh, both of them are the, pre uh, the clinical compound. One is from GSK, the other one is from Prelude. Here, if you test them in a pair of MTAP isogenic cell, you will see basically there's the two cell, the, the Q curve is on top of each other. Essentially, there's no selectivity as you would predict from the genetic findings. And as a result, uh, these compounds, they do not have therapy windows uh, in the patient. And on the right side, I listed the compound uh, in this uh, non-MTA cooperative category that are in the clinic. Uh, and although we see some sporadic uh, clinical responses clearly demonstrating if you eliminate PMT5, you could kill cancer cell. However, the common issue they are facing is really the both limiting toxicity and most of them are Tox, which is on target. So clearly, inhibiting PMT5 will affect the bone marrow. So uh, therefore, but therefore, because you cannot dose high enough to target your cancer cell, the therapy window will be limited. And uh, you know, this clearly um, do not have a path to go for the MTAP related cancer cell. And you know, just looking at the 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 reason why those inhibitors doesn't work. Here is a, a, you know, a mechanistic view of the different type of inhibitors. Um, shown here is a, a schematic view of the catalytic pocket of PMT5. And on the left side, you can see this is in the normal cell where SAM and the uh, protein substrate binding and SAM donate the, the, the methyl group onto the protein substrate. But existing inhibitors all working really in that setting, right? Some of them, uh, like GSK, is competitive with a protein substrate, but cooperative with SAM. Uh, there's another group, including Prelude, Pfizer, and JNJ, they're competitive with SAM. But either case, uh, they are really targeting this SAM PMT5 complex, which is uh, ubiquitously existing in both the cancer cell and the normal cells. It's hard to really shut down the PMT5 in this mode uh, in the cancer cell without touching the normal cell. In the MTAP deleted cancer cell, uh, you know, here actually because of high level of MTA, uh, many of the PMT5 will bind to MTA instead. MTA structurally is very similar to SAM, but you can see it is a much smaller uh, molecule without the methyl group. Uh, and uh, our program was really designed to take advantage of that spatial and structural differences. Uh, and the, the molecule we have, TNG-908, uh, working by really uh, form a tight interaction with both MTA and the surrounding amino acid cytokines and be able to lock um, PMT5 into this MTA, uh, inactive MTA complex. Therefore, uh, activity is much stronger in the MTA, uh, MTAP now, MTA high cancer cells, uh, but much lower in the wild type cells. Therefore, achieving that selectivity we we're looking for. And here is the, you know, the structure of TNG908. Uh, so it's, a, it's actually a very nice molecule with very good uh, physical chemical properties and the good uh, uh, pharmacological uh, 
you know, properties as well. Uh, on the right side, showing you the, the structure where you can see it's actually very similar to what we pictured in the in the uh, in the previous um, cartoon. And uh, you know, this program is uh, indeed uh, structurally enabled, so we know the handle for selectivity and MTA cooperativity there. And uh, just to go through some of the data, so here is a biochemistry uh, data, just showing you the this uh, cooperativity. Um, here are the two curves, uh, one is without MTA, uh, and the other one is a small quantity of MTA. And uh, here we are as they say, for the biochemistry activity against uh, H4 peptide substrate. And as you can see with additional uh, you know, small amount of MTA, you actually uh, shift the curve almost tenfold uh, based on IC50. If you look at IC90, actually the curve shifted probably almost uh, in a hundredfold, and which is probably more of what's needed to, to really uh, impact on the on the on the cell lethality there. And here is another assay, biochemical assay, but just looking at the binding. Uh, here we double titrated the PMT5 enzyme, and as as well as the uh, the the uh, TNG weight, and just in the presence or absence of the MTA. Uh, so here clearly on the right side, with the presence of MTA, the binding um, affinity uh, getting tighter. Uh, again, uh, for this particular compound, we see about tenfold enhancement. And that does translate very nicely into cellular activities uh, on both the PK, uh, PD, and as well as the uh, efficacy. Uh, so here is a, a HEP1 haploid isogenic cell lines um, that I showed before. Um, uh, you can see um, in this particular pair, TNG it shows about 15% and uh, 15x selectivity. And uh, this is also. Um, Reflected in the in the PD, uh, where in a, a really a wide dose range, you actually can see a separation of the PD uh, SDMA inhibition uh, that is a more much more significant in MTAP kill and versus MTAP um, wild type. And you can see that uh, not only by forward genetics, you can uh, do this in a cancer cell that is MTAP now and restore the MTA, MTAP uh, in those cancer cells. So those are two examples where after you re restore, restore the MTAP, you actually are you know, making the TNG nilate uh, almost 20 fold less effective. So again, you know, demonstrate the, uh, the untargeted mechanism here. And just to compare again to the to the non-MTA non cooperative inhibitors uh, here we're comparing to the GSK and prelude, you, you can clearly see that difference, right? The goal here obviously is looking for therapeutic window. So I almost view the wild type cell line as a surrogate for your tox organ, such as your bone marrow. So for in the case of GSK and prelude, you know, the same concentration you're hitting the the cancer cell, you're also hitting your, uh, you know, your bone marrow versus myeloid. You can find, you know, a large range of dose. Actually, you can you can hit the tumor cell hard, but spare the, um, spare the normal tissues. And again, if you compare the PD readout SDMA, uh, I think it's uh, also very clear. Uh, the non MTA cooperative inhibitor, they, they do not show any differentiation. And if you now are uh, looking into a panel of real cancer cell lines, here we tested about 200 cancer cell lines um, side by side with uh, TNG908 and the GSK compound. The two compounds are roughly equipotent in sensitive cell lines with IC50 of 110. But obviously, GSK does not have any selectivity. So clearly, if you color coded the cancer, the cell line for MTAP status, GSK, you do not see any selectivity versus TNG908. Just simply rank order the activity, you see very nice separation. People sometimes ask for 
what are the the blue cell lines uh, in the in the on the left side? Uh, those are some of the cell lines, probably by biology, most of them are heme cell lines, uh, extremely sensitive. So even uh, you know um, with this mechanism, because you bleed through, bleach through, and with compound has that has better um, selectivity as I. Going to show you with 462 later on. You can see that uh, those lines all go to the left. And also, um, when we move TNG now it in vivo, it shows very nice, uh, you know, uh, dose response uh, on both the, the, the PK exposure uh, and the correlated very nicely with, uh, you know, PD in this case again, SDMA inhibition, and that translates on the right side into nice dose dependent anti tumor activity in this um, MTAB now cells. And uh, if you run the same experiment uh, in vivo efficacy study in uh, isogenic pairs, uh, again, looking for uh, selectivity. Here we're using HCT116 isogenic pairs. And if you look at the, the, the biomarker, the PD here, there are a couple of things I think are very interesting. One, um, even in the vehicle treatment group here, we didn't normalize the two groups. So you can see the raw value of the biomarker activity uh, or PD activity. Even the MTAB now, the baseline level without any drug treatment is already only about half of the MTAB wild time, which is expected. Um, and, but with the drug treatment, uh, you can see that um, the MTAB wild type also get some level of partial inhibition. Uh, but what we have seen uh, in the preclinical model usually is um, only when the inhibition is above 90%, you're going to start to see a translation into a lethality effect. So in this case, you can see the two dose for in the wild type, the biomarker is still well above IC90. But in the MTAB now, you can see that uh, very clearly in both those that uh, the biomarker is really uh, inhibited all the way to the ground. Okay, this is where you would see, expect to see some, uh, you know, growth effect on the cancer cell. And that's exactly what you see here. Um, the same experiment, uh, the efficacy arm, you can see that uh, in the wild type on the right side, you see uh, very little to no activity uh, with the dose increase. And, but in the, in the MTAB now on the left side, uh, again, very nice uh, dose dependent increase of anti-tumor activity there. And uh, we have also extended that in vivo study into a panel of uh, you know, almost 60 uh, different CDX and PDX models. Um, obviously, in this case, all of them are MTAP now. The reason we hit running so many models is, uh, you know, really driven by the idea that um, the, the MTAP now is so common across many different indications. So one question we like to address is, uh, does the lineage background provide any difference, differential responses? Um, so you know, if you test the different lineage as listed here, each with a couple models, you will accumulate a lot of data. So here is the aggregation of all the data, and we plotted the response in a, in a somewhat non-conventional way just to keep it more visually uh, easy to tell, right? So from zero to minus 100, those are growth inhibition. Uh, at minus 100, this is essentially tumor stasis. And uh, then from minus 100 to minus 200, that that's those are the tumor into regression. And uh, in, if you have complete response, the number will be minus 200. So roughly from this data, we see two things. One, you know, about um, a third of the model, we definitely see tumor regression, and many of them are deep regression as well. Another third, we, we probably see very good TGI uh, and with uh, uh, inhibition around stasis. And the rest of them, we see some partial growth inhibition there as well. We haven't found any secondary genetic or pathway factors that could predict those response. 
but we also didn't see a very strong Lumigi effect that predicting the response as well. So that probably will you know, be a basis. Uh, we'll show you that in our clinical trial, we have a uh, you know, histology agnostic arm uh, that potentially could be something we can try with uh, this type of inhibitor. Just to give you some example of the, the efficacy data here, um, all these are tumors that can be derived uh, into regression by TNG bio -8. And you can see that, uh, number one, there's very nice dose dependency. Number two, uh, the regression we achieved, many of them are very much durable. The, the three models on the top, we continue the treatment, and you can see those tumors are continuously inhibited. And the, the model, the squamous model on the bottom right side, we actually stop the treatment, as you can see the arrow pointing to. So in this case, all the tumor has uh, complete regression, and even after the treatment, the tumor never grow back. And uh, for those who are doing you know, target therapy, you, you will know that this is extremely rare uh, to see any model with complete response that, um, and uh, with, with single agent particularly. The other feature for TNG908 is uh, unexpectedly, uh, we, we didn't design this way. Uh, we find that uh, this compound has really good brain exposure here. So looking at CSF and uh, versus plasma, the exposure is almost the same. Um, and we did some experiments for the orthotopic models uh, in the mice. Uh, even though in the mice, the brain exposure is only about 15% of the plasma. Uh, which is not really ideal, but still in this model, uh, we see a very significant, um, you know, delay of tumor growth uh, in this set, you know, suggesting that given the GDM has almost 40 to 50% MTAP known rate, and it's a very high MN band for need, uh, this potentially could be a useful therapy in that setting. So the next few slides, I want to talk a little bit about combination strategy because, um, you know, as we are fully expecting to see based on the preclinical data to see single agent activity, you know, to really cure any of the tumor, uh, I think with target therapy, I'm a strong believer that to, we need a combination to reduce the complexity there. So, um, you know, there are a couple of approach we, we used. Uh, one experiment we did is using a CRISPR-A um, Use the compound to run the anchor screen, looking for what gene activation could drive resistance. And then in this screen, we actually identified MAT2A as a very strong hit in this setting. MAT2A, as some of you probably know, uh, you know, is another hit in the synthetic screen for the for the MTAP now. Um, you know, the effect size is not as strong, but it, it is a program. You know, a few other uh, biotech and pharma companies has been trying to develop. Uh, the mechanism there for MAT2A is slightly different from PMT5. The, the consequence of inhibiting MAT2A is really the reduction of SAM. So in the uh, MCAP non cell, when PMT5 is already partially inhibited, reducing SAM potentially could uh, sensitize uh, those tumors to, uh, to death uh, compared to the wild type cells. So what we, when we were validating this result, what we find is those CRISPR-A region actually only have very minor um, activation, level of activation. So you can see from the resting block, probably two to three fold of you know, induction of the expression. And, but that's sufficient to uh, drive the increase. Uh, if you look at the second column uh, panel here, uh, increase of the, um, the SAM level, but not an MTA level. And the individual guide here, you can see it has a uh, you know, minor, about threefold shift uh, of the IC50 curve, but very much repeatable. And when we uh, you know, try to do that, push this to the extreme by overexpress MAT2A, here we actually see about uh, you know, seven to eight fold of uh, right shift, you know, suggesting this is actually a 
a potentially a real resistance mechanism. Interestingly, in the same setting, if you use GSK uh, compound, which is actually someone quoted um, here on the right side, instead of seeing a right shift, we actually consistently seeing a minor left shift, you know, suggesting higher level SAM actually is making this compound more uh, active. Um, so, but this is a scientifically a very nice confirmation of the drug uh, mechanism action. So that I think clearly brings an interesting angle of uh, combining PMT5 inhibitor, that is um, the MTA cooperative with a MAT2A inhibitor. So in the cell culture, those two reagents are very synergistic. We are still running in vivo combinations um, and uh, to looking for the effect size. One outstanding question though, is that uh, whether this combination is simply dose sparing or are they actually pushing uh, to a deeper response? Um, I mean, if it's only dose sparing, uh, particularly uh, if we have a more potent inhibitor, like our next generation inhibitor, uh, this may not be as much useful, but that's a question we're going to answer um, for that particular combination. Um, we also you know, speculated that, uh, you know, given that there are multiple lesions in the cancer cell, reagents targeting other oncogenic or tumor suppressor gene loss could be potentially be useful. Now, here I'm showing you two examples. The first one is uh, in a cancer cell with a KRAS mutation, GTLC mutation, combining with a, a GTLC inhibitor. So in this case, clearly the single agent is only giving you a partial inhibition to stasis, but the combo is very synergistic and driving the tumor into complete regression. This is another example where uh, given all the MTAB now cancer cells uh, will also carry a CDKN2A deletion. So we speculated a combination with CDK46 inhibitor could be a interesting based in based on the, the genetics and the mechanism. mechanism. So, uh, and we are actually seeing very interesting combo activity here in the same model where uh, the powerful single agent actually is, is doing very little, you know, it's very much inactive. But the combination actually drive the tumor from stasis into a, a very reliable regression. So, and given that almost 100% of MTAB now also harboring CDKN2A, this potentially could be a very uh, impactful combination. So lastly, I think I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, touch on, you know, two quick MOA questions, right, which we open encounter and we ask ourselves. The first is how much M3 is needed for this mechanism to be really working? And uh, on the left side, this is a publication from last year where we raised the question, what this paper uh, claim is that the MTA induction in those MTNOL models are limited. And therefore, you know, this might jeopardize uh, the, the, the potential for a inhibitor with such a mechanism. But they claim that in, this, in their measurement, the isogenic pairs has as little as six fold MTA induction. And therefore, this is different from what the Broad and the Novartis paper claimed to be 10 to 100 fold. So, what we decide to do is actually um, to, you know, given that they, they don't have an MTA cooperative inquiry to address the issue, we decide to answer this question in a, in a systematic way. What we did is we actually use, take advantage of a MTAB uh, inhibitor so that you can titrate that in to really create a gradient of MTA SAM ratio. And under that condition, to looking for how does that impact on the uh, activity of MTA cooperative inhibitors. So uh, in the, on the right panel, in the left side, you can see when you titrate in different MT, MTAB inhibitors, you're creating a gradient from like two-fold induction all the way to roughly tenfold. And uh, on the right side here, we're you know uh, testing the activity 
of a anti-coagulative PMT5 inhibitor under that condition. What we see is the, the curve on the most right side, this is the you know, wild type setting, okay? As you start titrating MTAB inhibitor and increase MTA level, even at the lowest dose where we only see a two-fold MTA induction, we are actually seeing almost three-fold, three to five-fold left shift already, okay? At the next concentration, we're seeing five-fold induction of MTA. We actually, you know, there is a full 15-fold left shift. And on top of that, adding more MMTAP, uh, MTAP inhibitor or even genetically knockout MTAP are not going to further sensitize these tumors. So this actually, we repeated this in multiple models. The result is largely the same, suggesting the concentration you need uh, for the MTA elevation is actually small. You don't certainly don't need um, hundreds, uh, tens to hundreds fold, uh, but maybe even a couple fold will be sufficient there. So that's clearly, I think, a, a low bar to go. The second question I think also uh, commonly asked is that in the real tumor setting, right, you will have your normal tissue. And given that in, you know, in, in the surrounding tissue or uh, potentially tumor heterogeneous uh, population, the, the question is if a MTAP mouse cells is in the neighborhood of MTAP wild type cells, will the MTAP wild type cell serve as a sponge? to absorb over the extra MTA and therefore um, really, you know, um, decrease your efficacy. So for that question, we did a, a mixed cell experiment where we mixed a, a color labeled the isogenic cell, mix them together and then mix them together at different uh, ratios and then either with or without uh, our compound. What we see very clearly is it doesn't matter how much ratio you're mixing, whether it's 90% wild type cell or 90% mutant cell, um, with the compound, you will immediately to see, start to see a depletion of the MTAP uh, now cells. And uh, in the end, the wild type cell will all take over, suggesting that the mixture really doesn't really change the intracellular kinetics of how the compound is working. And, uh, you know, the the compound can still precisely select the MTAP now cells in that setting and without also without harming the normal tissues, uh, assuming they are probably in the proximity of the those tumor cells. So that's also very good news for us uh, for this to pushing this into a clinical setting. So just very quickly, I think uh, on the development side, uh, so the program is currently in. Uh, you know, the dose escalation phase. Uh, our our design is really dose escalation in any solid tumor, but the requirement is uh, has to demonstrate an tap deletion. And once uh, the dose is identified, we are going to expand into a couple different cohort. Um, some of the cohort like MTNST, uh, this is a very rare um, sarcoma, uh, but very it's very high MTAP now deletion rate and potentially could be a you know, fast registration pass. And in the middle, we have a several cohort of the, the sort of normal, um, you know, lineage-based uh, dose expansion uh, just to really evaluate the efficacy in those few different indications. At the bottom, you can see we also have a histology agnostic cohort to evaluate as a whole population uh, well, you know, based on the preclinical data, could this uh, become a strategy to move this compound forward? So uh, maybe the next few minutes, I will just uh, quickly touch on the next generation PMT5 inhibitor, uh, TNG462. Uh, the reason we are so much into developing a second generation is uh, really because this is such a large cancer population and if it is working. And uh, we currently also have competitors from Amgen and uh, Maratis. Uh, I think, you know, given the knowledge that we developed internally for knowing 
the the selectivity as well as potency handle. So we continue to develop uh, TNG462 as a second generation inhibitor. So you can see um, on this panel, um, this compound is probably about 20 fold more, more potent, four nanomolar than 110, and a couple fold more selective against uh, MTAP disease itself. So it's really, you know, uh, a much better compound uh, in terms of the potency and also has a very nice uh, long PK uh, exposure as well. So the for the selectivity you can actually appreciate from this panel, the same 200 cell line panel where with 462, uh, you can see, you know, NIOETA is already pretty good in terms of separating the, the red from the blue, but uh, 462, you can see uh, the, you know, it's it's just super clean uh, uh, in terms of separation. In the in vivo setting, uh, and uh, 462 is uh, also outperforming 908. Uh, in some of the already you know very sensitive models uh, to 908, you can see 462 at the lower dose uh, can really induce deeper regression as well as more durable regression. And uh, lastly, this is an experiment I think also very interesting. We have one model where um, we actually did observe the tumor regrowth under the treatment of TNG908. And uh, so if you blow the, the growth curve up from the left side, and you look at the right side, you can see that um, even with the continuous treatment, the blue, uh, the, the gray curves start to you know, uh, pointing north. Uh, but if we do a switch here at the point where we see that TNG switch and change it to TNG462, actually you can see those tumor uh, change the direction again, goes into regression and stay regressed. So I think, you know, again, this is one model we are still looking for what is the resistance mechanism, but certainly suggesting that at least in some cases, a, a a more potent inhibitor could probably give you a better response, more durable response, as well as potentially preventing some of the resistance mechanism with the first generation inhibitors. So, um, yeah, with that, uh, just a quick summary. I think we I just showed the data that uh, this is clearly a novel class of uh, PMT5 inhibitor, and uh, we are well positioned in this area potentially to have the first in class and the best in class. And lastly, I want to just, you know, uh, this is clearly a, a, a large team effort. Uh, this is uh, from the summer party from the Tango from last year. Once, one thing I just want to highlight, actually, just draw your attention to this gentleman. He's uh, Dimitris, uh, who was our um, head of uh, a CMC and head of um, program management, uh, a longtime colleague of mine, a great scientist and great friend. You know, during the COVID time, uh, he actually unfortunately was uh, diagnosed with uh, uh, pancreatic cancer. And uh, he was, uh, ironically, his sequencing results suggesting he has a, a MAT2 deletion. Um, and uh, he, you know, he has been a fighter, really, you know, stayed very strong and always making jokes with us, uh, telling us that he will wait until we have the drug in clinic to really, he will be the first to, 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 to be dosed. Um, obviously, the, the disease took his course. Uh, he passed away last year without uh, had a chance to, um, to really, uh, you know, being in the clinical, any clinical testing. Um, but I felt, you know, this is, you know, this just reminds us of, you know, what we are here for, right? So to really making life-changing uh, medicines uh, to really help people, including ourselves, maybe one day in the future. So, uh, so I just want to take this opportunity, given this month is uh, pancreatic cancer month, uh, to call, uh, you know. Uh, really 
you know, tribute to uh, Dimitris for his contribution. And obviously, thanks to everyone else in the Tango contributed to the project. So that's that. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, we'll like to hear some, any questions. Thank you so much, Alan. That was a really wonderful talk. It was a very interesting story also, um, one that I can definitely appreciate. Um, I actually am gonna take the opportunity as moderator to ask the first question. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, so in some of your in vivo models, you showed a latency period before regression. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that's typical of a lot of epigenetic inhibitors, um, but you didn't see that in some other models as well. Do you know the difference and why you're seeing a difference there between the latency periods and the different models? Yeah, no, that's a very good question. I, I think, you know, we probably see, you know, more models with that latency where at, uh, you know, day seven, even, it, it looks like a tumor is still growing, then suddenly they, they, they change course. I know this is very typical of uh, some of the epigenetics mechanism here, right? And the only answer I have is um, probably, uh, you know, this, this PMT5 inhibition has a, has a, a you know, it's a multifactorial effect where, you know, in some cases, uh, it may, may impact on, for example, some cell death mechanism right away, mm -hmm. and uh, cells just start to die. But in other cases, maybe it's inducing stasis, um, and, uh, you know, uh, and if only after a while accumulation, the cells start to be kicking a, a, a death mode. Uh, we, to be honest, we don't have a, a good answer for that. Uh, I, I do think about this is also another thing I, I didn't have time to raise for the, even for the cell panel, you see lots of cell lines, even, even though they're uh, MTAP now, they don't respond well. Mm -hmm. uh, just remind you, those are seven day CTG. What we find is uh, even if you, you know, take those cell lines, they continue to treat for another seven day. Some of the cell will just crash and die. Uh, again, very typical epigenetics uh, type of thing, and I feel like seven-day CTG in this case might be underestimating the real effect here. Mm -hmm. That was actually my next question, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, on to questions from members of the audience. So James Casey asked, have you looked at SDMA levels in MTAP mutated tumor biopsies? And how well is the MTA SAM relationship maintained in different MTAP mutant tumors in suture? Yeah, you is a question about the clinical data. Um, or or yeah, or maybe not the clinical data, but just in general, if you've looked at um, SDMA levels in uh, tumor biopsies in themselves, yeah, the MTAP mutated uh, cancer. The, the correlation. Uh, the correlation is very nice, right? Here, I think I have one. Yeah, so you can see very nice dose dependency and the correlation with SDMA. We have done this with both Western blood and IHC, and those correlated really well. And this is another example of the correlation there. Yes. And, and what we find is you really need to crush the SDMA to see efficacy, right? In the in the some of the the first generation MPMT5 inhibitor, they have some, for example, 80% SDMA inhibition at a given point. I, I think that's probably not sufficient to to prove that this will translate into clinical activity. Mm -hmm. You need to crush it. You need to keep it suppressed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, can be only achieved with uh, a, a much more selective reagent that doesn't harm the normal cell. Thank you. Um, and Kush Sharma asked, um, or said, hi, Alan. <laughs> Thanks for sharing the information. Um, do you think that advances in spatial genomic technology like Xenium and Merscope will advance precision oncology? Um, that's slightly outside of my head. <laughs> so maybe I will maybe defer this to someone else in the audience. 
Uh, oh, that's okay. <laughs> No worries. Um, there's another question um, from Michael Lee. Mm -hmm. Many of the PRMT5 inhibitors have shown good SDMA and inhibition, but no correlation with clinical activity. Yeah. Um, what other biomarkers have you considered for patient cancer selection? I think this is exactly what I said earlier, right? It's not the good correlation, it's all relative, right? If you show me 80% inhibition, clearly in the cancer cell line, even if in the cell culture, if you're consistently giving only 80% inhibition, the cell will be fine. Yeah. yeah. Cells has a very good tolerance for PMT5 uh, you know, inhibition. So you need to really shut it down. So roughly the IC90 for the inhibition will translate into IC50. You know, to get more inhibition, you need really IC95, IC98, yeah. right? And you need to do this consistently, right? You can, we did a washout experiment, even with say, you know, six hours without drug, uh, you know, the tumor comes back. The SD may come back, the tumor comes back. So I think it's all relative, right? Uh, I don't think, you know, uh, the clinical data out there is really convincingly saying they shut down the target, uh, you know, deep enough and long enough, and they still didn't see activity, right? So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, oh, this question comes from one of our, our BAS leaders, um, Michael Booker. Um, so he says, great talk, Alan. I have a question about the combinations. Um, could you please comment or speculate on the mechanism improving efficacy with KRAS inhibition as well as the CDK4-6 combination? So for KRAS, I, we actually did a quite extensive pathway analysis downstream, just looking at whether inhibiting one side is uh, impacting the, you know, the signal on the other side. Uh, and the conclusion, we actually looked left and right, and we couldn't find anything. The map kinase pathway and all the downstream SDMA thing looks like they're completely independent. So the only conclusion I can I can give here is that um, you know, maybe you don't need a pathway synergy in this case, where you know you have two completely independent method of eliminating some of the cancer fitness. And whether in, you know they just work uh, additively in the same cell, or you know, if you think about eliminating the complexity, maybe there's subpopulation of a cell more sensitive to one inhibition or, or more resistant to one type of inhibition, but maybe it's very hard to find one that is uh, insensitive to both. And that way you actually can reduce the complexity a lot more. So that's that's what I suspect. CDK four six. Um, we are still looking into the MOA. Uh, I mean, it's interesting that CDK two A deletion. Uh, they, as a single agent, they does not they do not actually confer any sensitivity to CDK four six inhibitor, and I think that's well known. But you know, clearly the pathway is impaired. Uh, there are some correlation there. So uh, we have some, you know, hypothesis in mind, but we are still testing it. We, we, we don't I don't have a complete answer for that combination yet. Great. Thank you so much.